background, you can do it by your detector response. So you can obtain particle identification, um, and you can throw out one or the other. Another thing you can do is by looking at the astrophysics. So if you have some modulation in your signal that is, uh, that is inherent to the dark matter and not to your background, you can try to use that modulation to separate your signal from your background. Um, and you know those things can be event by event, or they can be statistical. You can just say, OK, I'm going to look at my population of events and look for events that have modulation and events that don't. So let's just talk about the, um, the, ID, the particle ID through detector response. So we have you know, dark matter or neutrons going in and hitting your nuclei. And we have alphas, betas, and gammas that will hit your electron or any charged particle that goes by. It's going to hit your electron, um, and it's going to generate a signal. Now, of course, neutrons fall into this category, which is why we have to be very weary of neutrons. Um, but if you can distinguish this, then you are ahead of the game. So there are different ways to do that. When you have, a, uh, uh, when you have an event in a target, what happens? So let's say that you have this target and a uh, dark matter particle comes in and deposits some energy. Well, where does that energy go? So that energy will go into different ways depending on the target. It will go into heat, right? It's going to generate a recoil. That recoil is going to thermalize inside your target, right? So some of the energy is going to go into heat. That's phonons up here. Now, depending on your target, you're going to probably ionize stuff. You're going to have some recoiling thing barreling through your target. It's going to knock off electrons off the other atoms that were nearby. So you're going to get some amount of ionization in your target. And depending on the material, um, when those uh, ionized uh, particles recombine, you might get scintillation as well. So you can get any, uh, a, uh, any one of these from uh, an event. And so you have these different areas where you can try to look at the difference between an electron recoil and a nuclear recoil because the ratio of these things is dependent on the type of interaction. So if you have an electron recoil, the ratio of these is going to be different than for a nuclear recoil. Um, so you have experiments that will only look at heat. Like, for example, the first version of CREST or the Quora experiment, which is a, uh, a neutrino experiment, just looks at the heat from the event. Um, there's a lot of uh, experiments that look at the ionization um, of the event, and some that look at the scintillation. Uh, but if you really want to discriminate, you want to live in between. And so, for example, for CDMS, we look at both the phonons and the ionization. Um, for a whole bunch of experiments, most, mostly the noble liquid guys, We'll look at the scintillation and the ionization. And then there's also experiments that look at scintillation and phonons, like uh, particularly Crest and Rosebud. And different targets are used for each of these, uh, these, each of these. But basically, there's this triangle, and you can basically pick your technology where it lives to try to make that, uh, make that discrimination. So here's uh, an example from, Super CDMS, from CDMS, where you have a measure, which is you know, complicated, but let's just call it a discrimination parameter that looks at the ionization uh, yield for a particular amount of recoil energy. So here is kind of the phonon measurements, and this is a parameter that has to do with the charge signal. And you can see that electron uh, recoils, which are all these blue events, fall up here, and nuclear recoils, which are done with a californium source, um, fall down here. And so you can separate those very nicely. Um, if you plot your ionization energy and your phonon energy, you can separate those two. That's great. Um, and you can get 10 to the 4 rejection with this type of technique. But you see all of these other guys, this rain of blue guys that is coming down, and it's actually you see some blue spots in this nuclear regions. What are those? So those are um, surface events 
that happen in the surface and you know just behave differently, give you a different response in your detector, um, or uh, and and those are always a problem in these type of uh, of experiment. So what what you can do is fiducialize your experiment. So if you have surface events, you can basically try to get rid of your surfaces and look at a region on the inside of your detector where you don't have all these surface events. And you're going to see for both uh, uh, crystal detectors and for the um, uh, liquid noble detectors, that that's what people do. You're going to basically try to get this really nice homogeneous uh, region of your detector in the center away from all the walls where everything is understood and nice and behaved, and that's where you look for your dark matter. All right, so um, there are other ways of getting discrimination. So you can get pulse-shaped discrimination. For example, um, if you have argon, you might be able to get a different shape in your pulses and your signal depending on whether you have an electron recoil or a nuclear recoil. So you have some difference in the shape of your signal. Um, you can basically be insensitive to uh, uh, insensitive to elect, uh, electron recoils. And we're going to have a talk on bubble chambers later in the week, which use this idea where you basically say you make a, a detector that just doesn't, is not sensitive to electrons at all. Um, or you can basically use self shielding where you say, well, I'm going to look at this, I'm going to fiducialize really deep in my detector so that I don't have to deal with all these surface events. And there are other ways to do that. Um, all right, and then finally, we can have the, the uh, separation by astrophysical modulation. So we can have annual modulation and daily modulation. Um, and I think uh, I'll stop here so that we can talk about this uh, tomorrow, where basically you're looking at um, how, the, how your target is moving through, through the, through the um, galaxy, and it's getting a annual modulation as the Earth rotates around the sun, or a daily modulation as the Earth rotates. So I'll stop here, and then I'll take some questions. Great, so we have time for a couple of questions while we set up the next speaker. Hi. When you draw an exclusion curve, uh, you consider the detector structure, but you mentioned also that there were some field theory that considered not just the spin dependent or spin independent part, but the velocity part. So, how well, how much does the exclusion curve consider when you consider this effective field theory and not just the spin dependent part? Right. So, what we normally do is we say. We, we're, we haven't found dark matter yet, right? If we had found dark matter, this would be a very different uh, lecture. And so what we're doing right now is trying to see a signal that is in excess over what we expect from our backgrounds. So at this point, what we do is we all assume the simplest case, whether it's a spin-dependent case or a spin-independent case, and we see whether that is compatible, you know, whether we see an excess over our expected background. It, when we see an excess, when we're saying, hey, it looks like we're seeing dark matter, when we actually have a signal to look at, then you can use all of these effective field theories with different targets to try to narrow down the possible things that could be causing that excess. But until we actually see a signal, it doesn't, it, you can do the studies and make different plots of how, you know, which theories have been excluded, but in order to be able to talk to each other in the experimental uh, uh, dark matter uh, search community, we basically kind of all assume this kind of a vanilla Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and the vanilla spin independent case, or if you're looking for spin dependent, then the vanilla spin dependent case. All of these effective theories are looked at as a secondary thing until we actually get a signal. When we get a signal, that's going to become hugely important. Does that make sense? More question? Uh, so 
you talked about the necessity of getting your detector shielded unless you bury it in a, for example, two kilometers of ice. So I would like to know if, there, if, it's, if it's there any proposal for a dark matter detector at the South Pole, as, as we have like for neutrinos like Ice Cube. Yes, uh, so actually there's an experiment called DM Ice, um, which is proposing ex to do exactly that, to put in uh, dark, uh, dark matter detectors. Actually, they're trying to, re to check the DAMA result, which we'll talk briefly about tomorrow. Um, and their proposal is to put a sodium iodide detector, which is the same type that DAMA uses, down in the in inside of Ice Cube, uh, and use Ice Cube as a muon veto, like the world's most most expensive muon veto. Uh, so so yes, there are plans to do that. Uh, the vast majority of those experiments to it's to detect WIMPs. Uh, I understand that, but you have uh, experiments to detect another, other candidates, particles. Too. Yes. So the question is, uh, th what we're talking about today has been mostly on WIMPs. So as we go through the week, we're going to talk about different types of dark matter and how you go to about detecting those. And I'm going to talk about down to kind of the KV scale, and then there's going to be talks on axions, which uh, move over to the kind of coherent side as well. So today we're concentrating on kind of the the most generic dark matter or most, you know, the, the, the preferred dark matter candidate for a long time, which has been a WIMP. As we haven't found them, people have gotten more interested in other types of dark matter, and we'll talk about those as the week goes by. More questions? Okay. Any other questions? Yep. Got it? Yeah. Let's, uh, thanks, Inektal again. The other version. That's not the best. Nothing wrong with Mike. Okay, let's try this. I actually, yeah, I know. I watched part of the YouTube from the last week. I hate that, you know. Watching yourself is, is just so, uh, so annoying because you notice when you hesitate and when you say, uh, and then... And then you notice the mistakes you made because nobody ever, I mean, nobody ever in the audience notices, normally, yeah, rarely. But then you think, oh, God, you shouldn't have said this like this. So better never watch your own YouTube uh, lectures. It's, uh, it's not a good thing. Um, what else did I want to say? Yeah, I can compete. I made that joke already last week, but I can compete with your name. And it's also usually co uh, incorrectly pronounced. So at least two last names uh, uh, are required to give a lecture at this, uh, <laughs> at this school. So just to reintroduce myself, uh, in case you have forgotten since last week, my name is Stefan Söldner Rembold, uh, or in the Americanized version, Stefan Söldner Rembold. And um, I'm I'm a professor at the University of Manchester in the UK. Um, I don't know whether anybody has ever been there. It's, it's, in, the, it's in the north of the UK, about uh, two hours north of London. It always rains. It actually doesn't always rain. It's a very hot summer this year. There was an absolute temperature record, actually, on Friday, the hottest day ever recorded in the UK with 37 degrees. Um, and what you call a winter, we call a summer. Um, and what we call a winter, you don't want to know. Uh, actually, it's much worse in Chicago. Um, so, I will, I'll talk on neutrino detection. And Andre, and my apologies for not getting all the, the right letters, but, you know, uh, Andre, uh, uh, covered history of neutrinos, their sources, 
oscillations, matter effects, neutrino masses, and many other things, which makes it really hard for me because you basically already know everything about neutrinos. Um, and uh, I will, but I will therefore repeat some of the things Andre has said, uh, which, you know, hopefully just from an experimentalist perspective will help to make things uh, even more clear and also talk a little more how to actually produce neutrinos and how to uh, detect them and give some experimental results. Today I will mainly talk about oscillations. Uh, so as you know, I'll give a lecture in the morning and the afternoon and tomorrow, and then I'll be worn out and fly back to Chicago. Um, and uh, tomorrow I'll talk about sterile neutrinos and uh, a neutrino mass. So what's the reminder uh, from last week's lectures? What are um, the big questions? Well, the big questions are, are basically understanding that matrix or that equation which is up there, which is the PMNS matrix, which is written here assuming there are three active flavors of neutrinos. That might not be the case. Then the matrix is bigger, and we'll talk about that uh, tomorrow. And you can uh, parameterize this matrix uh, in, in, in a particular form with, this is not a unique way of parameterizing it, but that's the one we usually use. And that splits off the different terms which have different physical meanings in this matrix corresponding to uh, the, the 2, 3, 1, 3, and 1, 2 uh, eigenstates. Um, what we don't know here is, uh, well, what do we know, don't know about this? We don't know whether it is really unitary. That means we don't know whether this matrix is complete, whether there are other generations out there. We, we have some ideas about that, but for the purpose of the lectures today, I'll just assume there are three flavors. Uh, we don't know whether delta is zero or not, and whether CP violation exists in the, in the uh, neutrino sector. We also don't know the mass hierarchy. Uh, we, don't, we know that there are two mass splittings, and I'll talk about this, how you, why we know this uh, today, but we don't know how these two splittings uh, are ordered. Um, there are more questions which probably will come up. Uh, one is particularly about uh, this mixing angle 2-3, whether, uh, whether this mixing angle is, is uh, uh, maximal or not. There are a lot of plots here which, uh, and, and throughout this lecture, which uses, use delta chi-squared. I assume you know what a chi-squared is. It's a, it's a statistical test of a an hypothesis. And you usually you know, test different hypotheses. You calculate the, the different chi-square uh, between them. And the lower this number is, the more likely uh, is what, what you measure uh, or derive. So a question which we don't know yet is, is actually mixing here in this angle 2, 3. Is it maximal, or is it somewhere in the, one of these octants? I just mentioned here, this here because it comes up at some point in my lecture. Then, as I said, uh, this is the question of sterile neutrinos. So basically, in addition to the three active uh, neutrinos which we have, is there another one which a different mass splitting? And we'll talk about that tomorrow. And also, are neutrinos uh, Majorana particles, which means are they their own antiparticles? And the only way to test this is to look at neutrinoless double beta decay. This is the only physical process. Uh, well, there, 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 there are this, but the only process where we have uh, a realistic experimental chance to, uh, to observe whether this statement is true. And I'll probably devote a whole lecture on that tomorrow. So let me first talk, if you want to do neutrino physics, well, you have to get the neutrinos from somewhere and uh, then you have to detect them in some form or the other. Uh, and we are a little bit fortunate compared to our dark matter colleagues because we know uh, that neutrinos actually exist. You probably also know that dark matter exists, but you know, uh, um, yeah, but. <laughs> so, 
Neutrinos come over a wide range of energies. And this is here actually a nice plot. I took that from the paper by Sam Seller. Uh, the, of the cross-section for neutrinos as a function of their energy and where the different sources of neutrinos which we are aware of lie. At the lowest energy we start from the Big Bang. So these are the neutrinos. The cos it's like there's a, a cosmic microwave background. There should be a, a cosmic neutrino background. We haven't seen that yet. It's related. It, at some point there was a freeze out. The universe expanded. We should see uh, at very low energies these neutrinos, but it's incredibly, and there should be a lot of them, but it's incredibly hard to uh, detect something uh, at, this, uh, at these very low uh, energies. And uh, we often talk about the neutrino floor and dark matter, and that just shows that how, how hard it would be. I mean, ideally, dark matter experiments at some point might actually contribute to that when they, when they reach the sensitivity needed to see these uh, new, uh, very low energy uh, cosmic neutrino background. Um, then we have a whole bunch of uh, 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 different sources here, which just for lack of space, they actually should probably lie almost all on top of each other. Because all of these sources have something to do with nuclear physics. And everything which has to do with nuclear physics, where you have some kind of beta decay or so, normally lies in the MeV range, yeah? With a capital M. And it's always important to know scales, yeah? Uh, to understand uh, uh, um, basic scales in physics, uh, where, where things lie. And, you know, what's the radius of the Earth? I always ask these first, when we, when we, when we have new students applying, uh, it's one of the questions I ask, what's the radius of the Earth? And you wouldn't believe how many people don't know what the radius of the Earth is. So in physics, it's important to get a feeling for the size of things. So the energy here is of the order MeV, because all of these are nuclear processes. Terrestrial neutrinos come from radioactive processes in the Earth and could actually serve as a probe of how things work in the Earth. And I think, Andre, in one of the questions, we talked about this uh, last week. Then uh, you have reactor, solar, uh, supernova neutrinos. Uh, these all come from nuclear interactions in some form or the other. There is a difference, though. Uh, if you look at solar and uh, and reactor neutrinos, one, what's the difference between solar and reactor neutrinos? Anybody? Yeah, one's a neutrino and the other one is an antineutrino. It's very important because one comes from fusion and the other one from nuclear decay. But in order to record them, we have to be able to measure neutrinos in the MeV range, yeah? Then we come to accelerated neutrinos. And all accelerated neutrinos basically come from the same process. I'll have it on a, on a future slide. You start with protons. You, these protons hit something, a nucleus. This something produces pions. The pions decay into muons and neutrinos. And that's the neutrinos we have. That's the same process which we observe atmospherically as we observe in accelerators. The only difference in an accelerator is that we make it by hand, yeah? And in an accelerator, we are more limited in energies. We probably go to GeV scales, whereas if we look at atmospheric neutrinos, because the energies of protons in the upper atmosphere can be very high, you can actually go to higher energies. And then they're galactic and extragalactic, and there we get into astronomy. So as I said, the, the interactions which we have to use to, to record the neutrinos, to some extent, mimic the, the process how which, uh, they were produced. And, um, and they will depend on, on the energy. One process which uh, obviously is almost ideally placed to detect neutrinos from nuclear uh, interaction is just to, you know, you turn the beta decay around. You have an inverse beta decay, 
So in this particular case, you would have an antineutrino, so this would be from a reactor. Uh, you exchange a W, because that's, uh, uh, it's always weak interaction. You produce a positron and a proton in your target, which is whatever material is, would go into a neutron. Um, this is how the first neutrino experiments, a lot of the first neutrino experiments were done. Depending on, I mean, like a photon can resolve different objects depending on its energy or wavelength, the neutrino energy will also depend, uh, will also determine what we can resolve. If we go to lower energies, even lower energies than this, the neutrino, if you scatter on a nucleus, it would actually scatter on the entire nucleus coherently. Now, that is a very difficult process, but actually people have been able to see it, and perhaps if I have time, I'll mention it next time. Uh, because here, what you see is uh, not very much just this recoil. So this is actually, again, related to the dark matter. So if we increase the energies, well, we would think, uh, why don't we look for this process where the neutrino scatters? So this is the basic electroweak process. A neutrino can either to charge current or neutral current with the exchange of a Z boson uh, 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 scatter of an electron in whatever material we have. And that process is, of course, very nice because it can be calculated uh, uh, very, very precisely. Uh, there is no, nothing unknown in there. The problem is, if you look at the total cross-section uh, as a function of neutrino energy for these different processes, so here you see those uh, processes involving electrons. Uh, you see a peak here, which just comes from the S-channel production of a W boson, so you will have a resonance. But otherwise, these cross-sections are much, much smaller than the nuclear cross-sections, where you have a, neutri a neutrino scattering <coughs> on a nucleon. So for all practical purposes, if you want to build uh, it, it, it's, it doesn't always apply, but in many areas, if you want to ha observe neutrino interactions, then you have to um, look at these processes. And these are the processes which neutrinos undergo uh, in, uh, in this case. So here, uh, well, one obvious candidate is elastic scattering at relatively low energy, because here you see the neutron as, a, as an uh, entire object, you don't resolve it. Um, but the problem here is having a neutron in a neutrino in the final state isn't an experimenter's dream, yeah? Because uh, both are very difficult uh, to observe. So the next best thing we have is quasi-elastic scattering. Why do we call that quasi? Because, of course, if it was elastic, it would just be exactly the same in and out. Uh, but we change, if you want, we change the strong isospin. Uh, uh, we make a neutron, a proton here, and uh, that's, of course, a nice process because a proton and a lepton, charged lepton, are easy to, well, they are not easy, but they are measurable. Depending on the energy, so if, you, if this energy go, is, is of the order of 1 GeV, which is the typical energy of, of uh, strongly bound resonances, you can actually excite the proton and uh, uh, produce uh, delta resonances uh, here. Yeah? Um, then the, the delta resonance uh, will change the structure and, uh, uh, of, the, of the process, and you will see actually the decay uh, of the um, of the delta resonance in the form of a decay to a pion and a proton. If you then go significantly above 1 GeV, where all that doesn't apply anymore, and you start to resolve the hadronic structure of the proton or neutron, you start interacting with the quarks. That means you start to be sensitive to the parton distributions of the proton, and you get what we call deep inelastic scattering regime. Uh, so that is deep inelastic scattering actually formally is defined as you know the energy scale of the uh, through the energy scale of the intermediate uh, uh, particle which is we shouldn't forget a virtual particle so it's not 
this thing doesn't have the mass of a W or something like that. So the energy scale of this particle uh, defines what we resolve in this particular case. It's the proton uh, uh, internal uh, workings of the protons, which are relative, which are uh, relevant, which are described by parton distribution functions. Um, now, neutrino cross sections are incredibly uh, small, uh, and we should just remind ourselves, and of course what, what I use here is cross sections. Cross sections are usually expressed in terms of, uh, um, of areas or bonds uh, for, for better units. And if you just take the quasi-elastic uh, scattering cross section, uh, it is a very, very small number. Um, you can calculate the range um, of a, of a um, so the, the, uh, you can calculate the range of a neutrino in material uh, if you know the cross section and the um, and the density of the material in terms of uh, the You need the density in terms of neutrons per cubic centimeters and the cross section, which I have for one MeV, so it would be like 10 to the minus 43 centimeters squared. And if you want, you can do this over lunch. Uh, just calculate from these numbers, and if you don't know, how to write this equation, that's why I didn't end it. You can do it with a purely dimensional analysis. There has to be a length uh, at the end. Uh, the number, the length of a typical, or how long a neutrino would fly if it goes through lead. Has anybody ever done this? Anybody knows the number, how far a neutrino travels if it goes through lead? Any guesses? Before it does something. So you send the neutrino through lead and you wait and Wait for the first interaction, the statistical number, of course. Any guesses how, how much that is? It's two and a half light years. So calculate that, and you will see neutrinos don't do very much. And that is the, uh, that's the basic problem of neutrino detection. The only way you overcome this is by building gigantic detectors. Uh, because otherwise, if you have huge, even if you have a huge flux of neutrinos, the number of interactions is going to be very small. Do that calculation, it's two lines. So if you go to higher energies, basically high, I say, if the, the typical, uh, you know, it's larger than a GeV or so, the typical hadronic uh, scales, the uh, cross sections will rise uh, linearly with energy. However, for us, that's unfortunately not the dominant regime. The dominant regime is around 1 to 10 GeV, uh, where most accelerators will produce neutrinos. And in this area, uh, in this region, our understanding of neutrino cross-sections is actually really, really bad. Uh, that is a problem because this is, a, a two, this is an input to almost any measurement we do. These plots show on the top for muon neutrinos and on the bottom for antineutrinos the cross section divided by the energy. So what I said before, if there is a linear rise with energy, you see it here as a flat curve, yeah, because it's divided by the energy, okay? And you see if you go above 10 GV or so that this is actually true. And that is the region where the deep inelastic scattering part of the cross-section dominates, which we understand relatively well. But at lower energies, as I said before, we have the quasi-elastic process, and we have this resonance process, and we have very little data, and the data we have is, um, is, is, not, is not conclusive. Yeah? So this is a, a major problem for neutrino experiments, uh, which... Um, uh, uh, you see here, for example, you see the, the difference. The cross-section, by the way, for, uh, if you look at that number, 
um, here. So this is for neutrinos. Uh, there's a total cross sections where I can't see very well. Um, So yeah, so the antineutrino cross sections, uh, when you look at them here, neutrinos on top, antineutrino on the bottom, you'll see on the y-axis uh, about a factor of three difference. So the antineutrino cross sections, also an important thing to remember, are about a factor three smaller than neutrino cross sections. Why is that? Any guess what? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the quark content is, uh, it's not really the quark content. It's something to do with helicity. Yeah? Neutrinos are left-handed and antineutrinos are right-handed. And the quarks like to be left-handed. So you actually have different total angular momentum states you produce. And that is the cause of, these, uh, of this difference. So it's a direct consequence of the helicity structure of or the V minus A structure of the, of the weak interaction. Why is this important for an experimentalist? Because if you run with an antineutrino beam, you've got to run three times more to get the same amount of data yeah, in principle. Why, you know, with all these neutrino experiments out there, why is this such a problem? Why don't we understand this basic input to neutrino experiments better? And for the, to understand that, we have to go back and understand how neutrino beams are made, which I have uh, already alluded to before. So you start with a proton beam, because protons can be accelerated and they are stable. If you want to build a particle accelerator, there are a few simple rules you have to follow. Whatever you accelerate has to be charged and stable. Okay. Uh, so you can do that with electrons or protons or antiprotons or positrons if you want. You might be able to do it with muons, but that is a bit tricky and nobody has really managed to do that because uh, they don't live that long. But anyway, that's another story. So you have to start with protons in that case. You hit a target and you hit it hard with a lot of protons. And then this target will produce pions. You select the pions. Uh, and these are the last particles where you have access to their momenta through their charge, uh, so you can actually focus them. Once the pion has decayed into a neutrino, there's nothing you can do. The neutrinos will just go on. Um, the, in order to measure a cross-section, you have to know the flux of neutrinos. And to determine the flux of neutrinos from this mess, compared to like when you have an electron accelerator, is actually very, very hard. Because what you need to do, you have to simulate the whole beam setup which you have uh, to get uh, the flux. And just this is a picture of how uh, such targets look like. These targets are technologically very challenging. They have to be cooled, for example. You see this here, because they get hit by a lot of protons. Yeah? And they get really irradiated very hard, and they tend to break and things like that. Now, the only way to do this is to, uh, to get focusing through what we call magnetic horns. So these are magnetic horns uh, apply magnetic electromagnetic pulses, which basically uh, uh, focus the pions in such a form that the pions are already you know, their, their phase space is limited, so when they decay, we actually at least don't have the neutrinos going everywhere and anywhere. These horns were absolutely crucial to neutrino accelerator physics. They were invented, I don't know, 20, 30, 30 years ago probably, by Simon van der Meer, who was actually a, a very a, a brilliant accelerator physicist. He got the Nobel Prize, not for this, but he got the Nobel Prize for stochastic cooling which is another accelerator com uh, uh, concept which led to the uh, production, so which enabled the discovery of the W bosons in, uh, uh, through proton accelerators. Something is playing music. Is that me? Yes. Sorry. I turned it off, but it just doesn't give up. 
So the neutrino beam is, the typical neutrino beam is shown here. So the typical energies are in the GeV range, and as I said, you don't have, if you, if you go to an electron accelerator, you can just tell the guys in the accelerator division, give me a 2 GeV beam, that's it. But we can't do that, yeah? That's what you can do in a neutrino. So you always have a broad band of energies. By the way, the intensity of these beams is measured by something we call protons or targets on target or pots. And all the experiments in neutrino physics, uh, because that defines the, the intensity of the beam, it's just how many protons hit your target, yeah? So in this case, this is 7 times 10 to the 20 protons on target. Um, we call this a broadband beam, but we can do better if we don't want that. I'll not go through the derivation in detail. You, you can follow it yourself, but just give you the main, uh, the main idea. So what you have is a, uh, is, a, is a pion decaying into a neutrino and a charged lepton. When that happens, you can go actually without, so the easiest way to calculate that, at least for an experimentalist, go in the rest frame of the pion because then a lot of things disappear. So you do that, you calculate the energy in the rest frame of the pion, and it's a single number because it's a two-body decay. So the, decay, uh, the, 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 the energy of a neutrino uh, in, the, in this rest frame is 29.8 MeV. Okay. Um, now boost to the lab frame, and the, the boost is unfortunately not a boost just along one, let's say, the z-axis. It's a more complicated boost because the whole thing has a, when it decays, decays at an angle. The most simple way to do this is to use four vectors and to use the two tricks which always help with four vectors. One is when you write a four vector u, and I've written it here like EP. The, 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 the square of a four vector is always a mass squared. And the product of four vectors is Lorentz invariant. If you know these two things, a lot of the uh, calculations get a lot easier. So you can do that and actually square the four vectors of the pion and the neutrino. And uh, that shouldn't depend on which frame you are in. You do that calculation and you get that relationship with the mass of the pion, this energy which we already had, and these energies and the angle. Now, the energy of the neutrino and the momentum of the neutrino are the same because the neutrino is massless for all practical purposes. And if you put these things together, you get this equation, which is just E mu is the pion mass times this energy divided by this. And now we use uh, gamma and beta, um, which is as just P over E and gamma is E over M. We put that in and we get, uh, we get this. So for a forward uh, going uh, decay of a 9 GV pi on just random numbers, we get a gamma factor of 60 and a neutrino energy, which is exactly in that energy range where we were about 4 GV here. Yeah? However, this is the trick now. Why did I go through this? Because Actually, the energy of the neutrino will depend on the angle in which it is emitted, yeah? And by choosing the angle, I can actually choose the neutrino energy. And that's what people say when they say, I go off axis in a neutrino beam. So you can choose, and this is for, uh, I think this is for the NUMI beam, the black dots are the overall spectrum. And the green, red, and blue is if you go to particular energies. It doesn't become a delta function, but it becomes a lot more focused. So that's what means to be off axis. Now, experimental talks should have pretty pictures, so uh, let's keep going with pretty pictures. Um, so there are experiments designed to do this uh, kind of measurement, specifically of neutrino cross-sections. Because you might think this is boring, but it is almost the most important ingredient to do these measurements, and that's why I uh, introduced this here. So one of them is the Minerva experiment at Fermilab, 
and you come here with muon neutrinos, which is typically what your beam will be. Uh, you have some shielding, a target that's not there yet, but the main thing is you have an active target here. Uh, it's always good to have an active target in this case because you want to understand the structure of your interaction. Active target doesn't mean radioactive or anything like that. It just means that the active, a passive target would just be a target, something is produced, you measure it outside. An active target is a target where the, you can actually, you, you hit some, something, but then it's part of the measurement process. So you're hitting the detector itself. Yeah, and that's what we mean with active target. And uh, you can measure, and you measure the tracks, and then you have some calorimeters on the outside. And even though this is completely different physics at different uh, uh, scales, it looks like the Atlas. Uh, just a lot smaller, you have a tracking detector in the middle, then you have an electromagnetic calorimeter, then you have a hadronic calorimeter. Every experiment looks like this. And that has uh, something to do with physics and how uh, uh, particles evolve. Yeah? Um, this active target is a, is a scintillator, and uh, it, it has a, a pitch of about, so with pitch we mean, you know, what is the, the, different, the, the size of the the difference between different uh, active elements is uh, about two centimeters, and you have a scintillator and you have a wavelength shifting uh, uh, guide and fiber in between which you need to transport uh, the light. And then they get these events and now come back to what I showed you before. Uh, so this is a quasi-elastic scattering. This is a real data event where they measure, so they measure just the location in these scintillators. You see the muon, you see the proton. How do we know this is a muon, this is a proton, because the one, this travels more than the other, yeah? And you can almost see the Feynman diagram here, yeah? This is quasi-elastic scattering, uh, where you have a, 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 a neutron and a muon. Here is the, it's an anti-muon. It's here, and the neutron, it's not at the vertex, but that's what typically happens. Neutrons travel of the order 50 centimeters or whatever, or 30 centimeters, and then they do something. Here, the neutron was absorbed and produced something which, which was observed. And this is a deep inelastic scattering event, uh, which means we see a muon coming out and a lot of junk, which is the breakup of the nucleus. This is data. And of course, to do this, uh, they do a detailed analysis. You know, uh, uh, data analysis is not looking at pretty pictures. It's actually just for talks. Uh, to, to, you have to analyze this data, and then you, you extract the cross-sections from this. One thing I'm not talking about, but which is important for neutrino physics also, uh, is the question of nuclear uh, uh, processes. Because sometimes, unfortunately, unfortunately, we are actually scattering not on elementary uh, 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 nucleons, but we are scattering on on, on atoms or nuclei with, which are complex structures. And this leads to additional problems because we don't really see this clean process which we have on the left. But what happens is that the neutrons or protons which we produce can, for example, rescatter in the nucleus. And, uh, or you can scatter of a neutron and a proton at the same time uh, in your interaction. Uh, all these things happen. And they are very, very unpleasant because, like all particle physicists, I became a particle physicist because I didn't want to deal with the messy stuff nuclear physicists have to deal with. And now it's very hard to resolve these problems, uh, how these uh, interactions look like, and they lead to additional complications. How do we detect the neutrinos? Well, the most important part, once we have produced them, is we have to we have to detect charged particles. Uh, detecting, because they're electrons, okay, they are neutrons, they are special case, but most of them electrons, protons, and muons, that's what we have to. And uh, I'll go quickly through this. Some of you, I'm sure many of you have seen this before, but probably uh, uh, it helps to, uh, to reiterate on, on some of these questions. So we have to exploit the, um, the mechanisms by which charged particles lose energy, that's ionization, it's excitation, which leads to scintillation, Cherenkov radiation, transition radiation I'm not talking about, possibly Bremsstrahlung. So the ones which are really relevant here are the first three. 
because there are other ways of uh, which are other processes which are relevant for particle detection, but they are not as important for this discussion, so I'll leave them out. The one thing we should always be able to draw on the board is the beta Bloch equation, because it is at the heart of every detector. And uh, that's from the particle data book, because it defines how these detectors work. The beta Bloch equation is rather tricky to derive, but at least one should understand the, uh, uh, you can do it semi-classically, but to do it precisely is difficult. Just to give you the, the main uh, structure here, we have what a minimum ionizing particle is, and in terms of the beta times gamma, that's usually around 2, 3, and uh, uh, the values here in terms of the stopping power, the, the dE by dx, is usually around 2 MeV per gram centimeter squared. If we go to lower energies, the uh, uh, energy inc uh, the, the energy loss increases dramatically until the particle gets absorbed, which leads to something we call the Bragg peak. Uh, so that means that if a, a particle goes through a detector, it will absor uh, uh, lose most of its energy uh, at the at the very end. And then things happen at very high energies, uh, which which we are not too concerned about right now because this is not the energy region we show, uh, look at. Just a reminder, I probably skip, we can skip this, the energy, this is, a, this is a, a statistical process, so the energy loss is, because it is a statistical process described by a statistical equation, which is the Landau distribution, uh, that is, uh, now, how is that used, and I showed this last week, but it's just an animation, and you know, if you have a good animation, you should always use it as much as you can. Um, so one place where this is used is in time projection chambers, and um, this is the principle of a liquid argon time projection chamber. The neutrino comes in, uh, hits a nucleus, uh, charged particles will be emitted. That's the black lines which you see moving. Uh, the ionization of a minimum ionizing particle, which we just saw on the previous plots, uh, here is about of the order uh, a few thousand electrons per millimeter. Yeah, that's what it produces. The charges then drift, and the reason they drift through this volume is because you apply a high voltage on either side, uh, on, on the cathode side of about 200 uh, kilovolts, and you drift along this volume until you reach these wires, which are um, oriented at different angles to allow three-dimensional reconstruction. PPCs are a detector of choice in many areas, not only in neutrino physics. They all work on the same principle. That's why they are called time projection chambers. You project, you know, you use the time coordinate, to, uh, the time measurement to get one of the coordinates. Uh, what you see on these wires is you just have to imagine the first two wire planes, the uh, charge uh, drifts past uh, and induces a signal, which is typically bipolar. And on the third, it will be absorbed. That's called the collection plane. And um, so what you can do here is you can reconstruct the coordinates, but you can also measure the dE by dx. And to measure the by dE by dx as a function of uh, uh, the kinematic parameters of the, of the particle gives us the ability to actually uh, measure their ID, to determine the ID. And this is extremely powerful. This is the beta Bloch uh, formula again. It's just shown here for different uh, uh, nuclear uh, targets. And here, the scale uh, depends on whether it's a muon, a pion, or uh, a proton. And that's, of course, because it depends on beta times gamma, which is p over m. Um, this is not a neutrino experiment, but it just has just a beautiful plot to show the power of dE by dx and how you do these measurements. Uh, this is for Alice, this is a heavy ion experiment at CERN. And this is actually data which shows the measurement of their TPC, which is not a liquid argon TPC, but it doesn't matter, um, as a function of the momentum divided by the charge. And you see how the different particles line up according to their identity. An incredibly powerful technique to identify particle uh, properties, which is crucial to do these measurements. The same happens in a liquid argon uh, time projection chamber. So 
to repeat my, my joke from last week, uh, liquid argon is not blue, it's a, it's a transparent liquid. Um, but you see here from Argonute, and just to give you, this is the wire number, this is the drift coordinate, so these are the two coordinates. You see events and you can see all the workings of the beta block equation. At, uh, and, uh, uh, so there's a proton, the higher the ionization density is shown by, by a darker color. Um, there's a muon here, which is a minimum ionizing particle. And then gammas, which uh, you don't see directly, but you see through the electromagnetic showers, which they produce at some point. So they can be displaced from your primary vertex. Question? Mm -hmm. Same event? Uh, I think this is the same event. Yeah, it's just a different view. The other thing this provides, if you integrate the beta Bloch equation, and we do that up here, uh, so if we form the integral from the energy we start to zero when it stops of dE by dx, yeah, then we get the range of the particle. And you have seen before when I showed some of these uh, events that uh, when there's a proton, it stops quicker, uh, you know, the, and so on. You can actually... But once you know actually the identity from, let's say, ionization, then you can use how the length of the track in your liquid argon detector to determine its momentum. It's actually only one of two ways you can do that. The other one is through multiple scattering. So you measure the length of the track, and that gives you the momentum. And that is because it will depend on... Uh, um, on uh, uh, the momentum of the particle, and this is just, for, again, for example of lead, because here's only lead on that curve. You take the typical numbers of one GV proton in lead will actually not go to light years like the neutrino, but 20 centimeters. This picture shows just, uh, I just love it, because it is so beautiful. It shows the, uh, all this, uh, how it works. This is a data picture. You see the stopping muon, the Bragg peak at the end, uh, an electron from the muon decay, photons. Yeah? Uh, this is... Uh... So the other thing, so this is one type of neutrino detectors. The other type of neutrino detectors are exploiting a completely different effect, which is Cherenkov radiation. So Cherenkov radiation happens when a particle, a charged particle, travels larger, faster than the speed of light in the medium, which is perfectly fine. Um, when that happens, you get an interference uh, phenomenon, which is uh, shown on the bottom picture, because basically the wavefronts overlap, and you get constructive interference, and um, this gives you Cherenkov radiation. Uh, and by the way, Cherenkov was a Russian, so there's... Sometimes people put that little hook on his name so this doesn't make any sense, yeah, because he's not Czech. Um, and um, the conditions for Cherenkov radiations, and I think this is probably undergraduate physics, but anyway, is, is shown here where you have a particle going with a velocity beta times c. Uh, you have the wave front, and if you put in just the geometry of that, you get that the opening angle of that is just 1 over n times beta. So once you know n, you can determine beta. When you know beta, you know which particle you have. So you have a direct, because p beta is p over e, you have a direct connection between uh, particle, uh, uh, um, the, the opening angle of the trank of radiation and the particle ID, and that's what you exploit. It uses beta, by the way, which is, means it doesn't work for very high energies because beta is P over E, so it gets, once you get to very high energies, uh, you'd have to th use things that depend on gamma, not on beta. Another thing we should remember of, about Cherenkov radiation is that if you calculate the number of photons per unit wavelength and, uh, and length, you get this equation, which if you integrate over... Uh, you get to this term here, so it has to be alpha because it's electromagnetic, 1 over lambda squared sine squared theta uh, of, the, of the Kabibo angle. So there, is a very, there are two bits of information in this, which is important for a Cherenkov detector. The emission goes like 1 over lambda squared, so Cherenkov light will always be blue. And the number of photons... Uh, 
is proportional to the to the uh, uh, to the um, sine square theta to the Cherenkov angle. Uh, and both can be used, not only the size of the cone, uh, to extract information. So this is how would this look like in a Cherenkov detector, uh, like a big water Cherenkov detector. So most Cherenkov, uh, 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 you know, the, the detectors you build with, with water, uh, as we said before, neutrino interactions are very rare. So you try to build them with something which is easy to produce in large quantities. And there's nothing as easy to produce as in large quantities as there is water. Yeah? So uh, the muon neutrino and the electron neutrino will produce different types of rings in these. And uh, that is, first they have to convert into a muon or, uh, uh, or an electron. And then you see a muon ring, which is a well-defined, this is because of what I just said about the number of photons, and uh, a ring uh, with a particular angle, whereas for an electron, um, uh, you get both a characteristic uh, uh, ring, you also get a more fuzzy ring due to the showering of the electrons. Finally, the third method, so DE by DX, uh, Cherenkov and scintillators, the third method is, is scintillation. And scintillation is usually done, again, what then can I get cheaply to make a big detector? some organic uh, material like oil or something. Yeah? And there are different, so scintillators are usually organic material, at least the ones we use here. By the way, argon is also a scintillator, but I left this aside for a moment. So there are a lot of neutrino detectors which are based on scintillation. And scintillation, again, is a complicated, this time, atomic physics problem. Um, this is just for some random organic uh, uh, molecule, uh, what ha uh, just the principle what happened. You absorb uh, uh, light, uh, you emit it either immediately or when we call it fluorescence or uh, delayed, we call it phosphorescence. And uh, the trick to, uh, is to, to then extract this light uh, and, and measure it. Uh, actually, one of the nice things about it is because you have these different mechanisms, these different mechanisms lead to different time scales, and a particle with a different DEDX will, uh, the DEDX will influence how the exact mixture of these different scintillation processes looks like. So by measuring the pulse shape, so how the pulse looks as a function of time, I can actually also learn something about the particle nature. So these are the tools we need and the ingredients. And a typical example for this is like a Dyer Bay detector, or also Snow, which uses, for example, this organic uh, molecule. And I'll come back to that detector later. And the final ingredient is PMTs. And I know you know all about these, though I'll jump, uh, because all these experiments have to measure light, and a lot of them need photomultiplier. Let me talk about this. I don't talk much about analysis, but I think this is an important point to make. Uh, because it is the state of the art of all the analysis in neutrino experiments and beyond right now. It is to do blind analysis. Every analysis that has a, you know, it's paying attention to its reputation will be blind. Why is that? Because we are all biased. When you do your lab experiment at university and you're supposed to measure alpha electromagnetic, and it's 1 over 137. And you do your experiment, and the answer is 42. You know what number that is. If your answer is 42, you realize you either got the answer to everything, or, or something is wrong with your setup. Now your problem is that your demonstrator, who has to mark you, will come in an hour. And he told you before or she, it doesn't matter what result you get. Mainly you thought about it, which of course we all know is not right, is just nonsense, yeah? Of course they mark you on whether you got 1 over 137. So you will manipulate the data. And that is, I know I've been there, so. Uh, uh, so I'm not going to ask who has and who hasn't, OK? So the, uh, um, and that's the problem. You see that in this particle data booklet 
uh, up there, which shows you the measurement of numbers as a function of time. Now, there are some reasons which are beyond bias why they have to be correlated if you have the same setup and there is a common systematic uncertainty, so I'm not too bad. But you see that a lot of these values, whatever they are, they never go, this one is a good one, yeah? But anyway, it goes just like this. It should randomly scatter, but it doesn't, okay? And that's why you blind analysis. It's very complicated to do that. So, um, I have five minutes, yeah? I started late. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, neutrinos, the story. So, we get neutrinos from solar, atmospheric, and reactor neutrinos, and that's what I start out with. And this is just a, 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 a quick story uh, how, how we actually know what we know about neutrinos. So, as I said, atmospheric neutrinos are uh, um, coming from protons hitting the upper atmosphere um, just due to the process uh, where they produce pi plus and also pi zeros, but mainly the pi pluses are relevant here. We expect a two to one ratio of nu mu and nu e in uh, atmospheric neutrinos. We also expect, uh, because there's a bias in the atmospheric uh, 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 charge distribution towards positive charges, which will also change the ratio of neutrinos to antineutrinos, because protons, which are the main source of these uh, atmospheric neutrinos, are positively charged. The way, so this is the detector which, which pioneered neutri, uh, uh, atmospheric neutrino measurement. Actually, this detector was built for a completely different purpose. It was built to find proton decay, uh, but it still hasn't found it. We haven't seen proton decay. But in order to do proton decay and measure proton decay, you have to also build, that's why a lot of neutrino experiments also do proton decay. You also need a lot of stuff, yeah? Um, and what Super Kamiokande in Japan actually, which is 50 kilotons of water, that's a lot of water, yeah? Um, uh, actually discovered is uh, something odd with neutrino uh, uh, is coming from, uh, from the atmosphere. Again, what I've shown before, the, 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 the way it works, you have a Cherenkov uh, detector, and of course uh, the water is surrounded by uh, uh, lots and lots of photomultipliers with very large face uh, to measure that. I think we already did that, which one is the muon and which one is the electron question. This is a, fo uh, uh, this is a photo of the, of the Super Kamiokande with a little man with a boat. This is a real photo. Yeah, so the muon is on the left and the electron on the right because it's fuzzier, yeah? That's the reason, because the ring is fuzzier, yeah? Um, what they saw, they have much better data now, but it doesn't really matter, this is good enough. Uh, what they saw, if you take the neutrinos and you compare where they come from, because you can do that in that detector because you know they come from the bottom or from the top. They come from the bottom, they've gone through the Earth, integrated over the different path lengths, which that means, because you don't know where it's produced, yeah? Uh, or when it comes from the top, it, comes, uh, it just went through the atmosphere. And when they measured as a function of this angle, the uh, uh, rate of muon and electron neutrinos, uh, they saw a clear deficit with muon neutrinos. So something was going on. We know now what it is, oscillations. Now, this was not the first odd result with neutrinos that uh, people saw, but the first result was actually neutrinos from the sun. So I know Andre showed that slide with all the processes uh, which happen in the sun. What's relevant here, again, the difference is we see always neutrinos from the sun. This is a typical exam question. Do you see neutrinos or antineutrinos? We had this before. Yes, neutrinos from the sun, antineutrinos from reactors. So we see neutrinos from the fusion uh, reactions. Unfortunately, because a lot of them are very low energies, we only see some of the processes which are more rare, uh, but which produce higher energy neutrinos. This is an incredibly complicated thing. And actually, I remember, well, I, I'll see th that in a moment. So, um, there was this guy uh, uh, who built, Davis, who built this experiment in Homestake, which is now the same mine where they'll build Dune, yeah, in South Dakota. It's the same mine. It's now called Surf, but it's in, in the same place. And um, he built this tank with 400,000 liters of dry cleaning fluid, which 
you can buy at the supermarket. So he went to the local supermarket and said, give me 400,000 liters of cleaning fluid. And um, that he did because it contains a lot of chlor chloride. Um, and as we said at the very beginning, the process we are looking for, because this is a nuclear process in the sun, the easiest thing to look for is just to reverse it and have uh, uh, inverse beta decay. And you do that, and then you produce an electron and argon. Now, the problem is, how would we do something like that today? We would build scintillators, we measure everything out. And so he did something which I find still mind-boggling. They, once a month, pumped the whole detector uh, empty and, and, and looked for the argon atom in a chemical way. That's crazy. Um, and they found, on average, five atoms of 37 argon. I, I, I don't understand chemistry very well. I don't know how they do this, but it is uh, somehow, I guess there was a graduate student there who just chlor, 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 argon. Uh, or whatever they do. No, it's, it's some chemical process. I, I don't know the details. But now, this is amazing. It also has one big disadvantage, which no modern detector would do. There's no online information. Yeah, you do that once a month. You do that, and he has done this. He did this for 20 years or whatever, always updated the plot. And nobody believed the result, or, because for a few reasons. This so, the sun is a complicated beast. Yeah? Uh, it's not as complicated as the Earth in some ways, as we said last week, but it's complicated. So all this stuff and a lot of these processes depend with a very high power on the energies of the, uh, involved. So nobody trusted the uh, models. Five atoms in this tank, really. So, um, however, he always found that uh, he saw only one third of the neutrino flux. And he was right, and together with the atmospheric result, we know now that's due to neutrino oscillations. Now, unfortunately, it wasn't really positive proof. Positive proof, the only thing he showed that there are fewer electron neutrinos coming from the sun than a third, but he didn't then expect it. But you know, whatever, that could have been because the solar model is right wrong. It doesn't tell you where they went. So what you wanted to build, and this happened quite a bit later, is an experiment that is sensitive at the same time to all three neutrino flavors. So that you see where did the other ones go, and if the, all of it sums up to the model. Again, a scintillator experiment, this time with heavy water. Heavy water is um, two minute, one minute, two minutes, yeah. The earlier I stop, the less I have to prepare for the afternoon. Um, so heavy water is a tricky thing. It's, it's very expensive. Uh, all the arguments about water being cheap doesn't apply for heavy water, yeah, because uh, it, it, uh, it's used in, of course, in fusion experiments and stuff in reactors. Uh, uh, and the Canadian government gave it, they, they lent it to the, uh, to the experiment. Again, uh, you do the same thing, you get Cherenkov cone and, uh, and, and voting multipliers, all the same principle for these detectors. I shouldn't say, it, I mean, this is very, very hard to build, but the principles are always similar. It's the same with experiment and theory. The principle is always, you know, the, the experimentalists show you never how hard the work is to build these detectors with all the electronics and all the, the they just show you pretty pictures. The theorists, they just show you a nice Feynman diagram and the final equation, and they don't tell you that they are sitting, you know, doing little calculations all day. So both, both things are much harder than these pictures look like. So what you have to do, you have to come up with a detector which measures all flavors at the same time, and that's what they have done. Uh, so the first thing is the charge-current interaction, which we have seen now many times before. And what we use, of course, they had a, must have a reason. Why did they use deuterium? Uh, because the deuterium helps you uh, uh, to do that. So you have the deuteron, which, as a reminder, has a binding energy of 2.2 MeV. Uh, and uh, you break this up, and you get two protons 
and because they're one of the neutrons becomes a proton and you produce the, um, uh, the electron and from that you get a Cherenkov cone. So that would be the signature for that. This is only sensitive to nu E, okay? Then you have other processes, however. So uh, here with the exchange of a Z, and in the moment when a Z is exchanged, or a Z in America, a Z in England, uh, then the flavor doesn't play a role anymore. Any flavor goes, yeah? So it's good to be sensitive to that. And in this particular case, the final state is an electron and a neutrino, and here the other way around. And so in both cases, you see a neutrino, and actually you don't, but you see an electron, yeah? The nice thing about this elastic scattering, by the way, is that it's directional sensitive, because elastic scattering, you know, you know where it, uh, uh, and this is, uh, this, you see it actually comes from the sun, which is kind of nice. And by the way, what was the dark matter? You, 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 it was a bit of bragging about how many dark matter particles go through us all the time. I think neutrinos, do neutrinos beat the dark matter? Uh, probably do, yeah, 10 to the 12 neutrinos must, must, yeah, 10 to the 12, much, much cooler. Um, so these are neutrinos from the sun, they come from the sun. By the way, if the sun dies, this is so, this could be used as a, a, a sun warning system. Why? Because a photon takes 40,000 years to get out of the sun. A neutrino instantaneously gets out. So when neutrino experiments run out of neutrinos from the sun, you know something is wrong. What we'll do about it is another question. Um, then they added salt, simple table salt, yeah, calcium chloride. And uh, the, uh, no, it's not, it's, not, it's sodium chloride, it's not, uh, potassium chloride is table salt. Um, and um, this has a high absorption cross-section, oops, and uh, 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 for neutrons, because the neutrons are always a problem, yeah? So you want to add something which gets you the neutrons. It will absorb the neutron and release a gamma which has an energy of about uh, several MeV. And that process is sensitive also to, because it's a Z exchange to all flavors. Now you measure everything in the same, uh, in the same plot, yeah? And what you do then, because you don't distinguish between muons and taus, so you plot your mu tau flux here through all the processes that which go uh, uh, not, uh, uh, are not sensitive to, um, uh, uh, to, to, the, to the flavor. And then what you will get is for the processes which only measure fi uh, the electron flux, you get a curve like this. You also know that the sum of the fluxes has to add up yeah, to the total flux. So, in order, so you'll get other, depending on your efficiencies, you'll get other constraints which are like this, yeah? With your errors, so the width of these are just errors, yeah? And that is just because phi mu tau plus this plus this is a constant, yeah? And where they meet, uh, that's where you should be, and that's how these plots look like and why they look like this. So here is, this is only sensitive to phi e, so this is the uh, uh, charge current uh, and the neutral current ones, the different process depending on their relative efficiencies for the different flavor will give you different um, slopes, but they all give you a curve like this. And where they meet is the, the answer, and the answer is that all neutrino flavors add up to, uh, so all of them are uh, 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 observed and uh, the electron neutrinos are actually um, going to mu and tau. And that is the positive proof that this is actually due to neutrino oscillations. Okay, more in the afternoon. Okay, so we have time for a couple of questions. As you notice this week we are running very tight on time, so instead of uh, cutting a bit of the coffee break, I'll just delay it a little bit so that we can ask a couple of questions. 
questions? All right. So uh, we, we come back after coffee break, 50 minutes, and then we have Ettore, and then in the afternoon, again, Stefan, and you'll have the opportunity to ask more questions. What's happening now? So I have to talk. Break. No, I have to talk to this woman. Oh, yes, the interview. The interview. Yes. We can. Uh, I think it's in. What they say there. Hi, <laughs> Steph. How are you? Good. How are you? Got involved in Brazilian politics. I saw it. Well. <laughs> Just, you know, 